What's up, everybody? How's it going? Welcome to the Artist of Data Science Happy Hour. Super excited to have all you guys here. It's uh, Friday, April 16th. Wow. Can't believe it. It's already middle of April. Uh, hope everybody is doing good. Hopefully you guys got an opportunity to listen into the interview I did with uh, John K. Thompson. He's uh, quite a legend in the field. It's quite a pleasure to be able to uh, to speak with him. And um, yeah, man, super excited to have you guys here. A bunch of people in the waiting room trying to get in. We got, we got some good friends in the house. What's up, Vin, Tom, John Sebastian, Matt. Joe, Joe's in. Tor, how's it going, man? Uh, hopefully everybody is doing good. Tom, how you doing? Good. How are you, buddy? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Trying to open up the chat. I opened up the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to make... Am I spotlighted for anybody? Because I think I might have accidentally hit a spotlight button, but I can't tell if I did or not. No, we're, we're in matrix view right now. Awesome. Perfect. Right on. Hey, well, super excited to have all you guys here. See some new friends here. Nathaniel Wise, how's it going? Wait, I think you are here a couple weeks ago, right? Uh, Kristen, how's it going? Joe, how you been, man? What's up? Hey, so you guys have been doing some awesome stuff with your podcast, man. Like, I haven't got a chance to check it out yet, but talk to us about this, the the, the Data Nerd Herd show. Oh, whoa. what's up? Yeah, I've had actually a few, few people in here have been on it. What's up, Ben, Tom? uh yeah it's been it's been a lot of fun i think it's just uh trying to make candid conversations with data people uh maybe a bit off the beaten path um yeah. so yeah it's been a lot of fun hopefully uh, the guests have had a lot of fun too so awesome man yeah you got a link to that man so we know where to find it uh mark what's up mark heads up i sent the book in the mail today so hopefully you should be having your book in your hands by uh next week at the latest, I hope we'll see. We'll see how it goes, man. Vivian, how's it going? Right on, man. Well, look, I'm super excited to have all you guys here. Let's go ahead and uh, start taking some questions, man. So, if anybody has a question, please go ahead and unmute yourself and go for it. Uh, in the meantime, while that person is asking their question, if you got a question, go ahead and just type it right there in the chat, and I will add you to the queue. Vivian, go for it. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a hard, heady topic, but. I started reading um, Lean In, you know, by Sheryl Sandberg. And I guess that just, this is something that's been on my mind ever since I started learning data science. And ever since I started coming to this group and I haven't wanted to bring it up because it's uncomfortable, but I guess I would just like to talk about, I don't know, what people's thoughts on like diversity, you know, particularly gender diversity. I feel like I have faced I'm sure that a lot of people have faced some feelings of discrimination here for various reasons, but I guess I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm struggling. I'm feeling like this is frustrating. I'm feeling like, I don't know. It's just rough trying to be a woman in this world. And like, I have so much ambition and constantly kind of being kept down and like punished for having a lot of ambition you know, being told I'm like prickly and things like that. And I don't know, just if anybody has any thoughts about, uh, you know, where they see this going or any, you know, if anybody just wants to bitch about stuff that they've experienced, that's welcome to. <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely. Well, first I'll let John Sebastian take this over, but I mean, I think you're pretty freaking awesome. So if that counts for anything, uh, you are awesome. I love your questions. You're doing great. And, um, yeah, man, it, it's, it's, I'm sorry you feel that way. And I, and I know how hard it can be, but you got this. You, you trust me, you'll, you'll, you'll handle this. You got your hand on this. John Sebastian, go for it. Yes. So actually it's, uh, it's quite interesting because uh, your question is very on topic for what I'm doing this week. So um, I was just working on, on building some sort of workshop for the, for imposter syndrome. And I've been reading this book. Um, fortunately, I can't remember the, the title, but I, I'll post it in the chat. So basically it's, um, it's about how women can become successful and how they are, um, they are targeted uh, by the imposter syndrome. And it's just, you know, I've read so far uh, two thirds of the book. It is just amazing. And I would strongly recommend you to go through this and actually pretty much like for 
any of us who would have some sort of uh, feeling of not feel, not being um, on level with other people, it's definitely something that I would recommend you to read because it, I think it extracts the, uh, the essence of why we're feeling unprepared or uh, why we're feeling that somehow being discriminated for whatever reason. And, you know, some of these reasons might be just our own fault, but some others might not be our own fault. Uh, some are just, you know, perception that we have, perceptions that are real. So, you know, if we have a perception that we're being uh, ostracized by, for whatever reason, even if it's just a perception, it's still real and you still need to be able to overcome that particular aspect. So, um, as Harpre was saying, you know, just try, and especially for women, and, and I'm just saying this, you know, out of, not out of experience, because obviously I'm a, I'm a male, but um, from what I've read, and it's, it probably fits with what you're going through, is that ambitious men are seen as, uh, as the gold standard, basically, but ambitious women are seen as arrogant. And uh, it's unfortunate uh, that it's like that, but I think it's, uh, at, at least, you know, if you are aware of what's happening, maybe, <clears throat> maybe there's just some other way for which you can actually just flip it around and just you know detach yourself from the stereotype that we have and so that you can actually move forward because unfortunately a lot has to do with just basic society just base basic stereotype that we have in our society which might not necessarily be real and uh, but unfortunately this is kind of ingrained in our culture so uh, I'll, I'll actually post the, the the book in the chat so that you can check it out. Yeah, I mean, I wish there's more women in the audience today. There's usually a good balance because, um, you know, that I'm sure they'd probably be able to, to give you a lot better the advice than most of the dudes here. Uh, but Mark, I'd love to hear what you got to say. And then after Mark, we'll hear from uh, Tom. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I have a lot to say about this because my background's in sociology and community health. And before I worked in like student affairs where like diversity and inclusion was like a huge component and a big reason why I got into data science was like, there's this lack of it. <laughs> um, and like, I need to be at the table to, to really fix that. And so I think the first thing I really want to highlight is that there's, there's two sides of it. There's a survival standpoint where like, I need to take action. And this is coming from being someone who identifies as black you know, identify as a woman or various layers, diff different experiences, but there's some parallels. You know, there's a survivor component of like, I need to modify my behavior to X, Y, Z just to be here. It's unfair, it's BS, but like, like for instance, I code switch. I, um, I don't say certain things or if I have a pain, I, I hold it back because I understand the social layer of it. The other side of it is, and I think this is the most important thing is like, it's not our individual jobs to, to fix it. And an emphasis on individual, it has to be a company-wide initiative. And I think going back to the survival component is like being very picky of like what company really upholds this culture. You know, are they even measuring uh, pay disparities? You know, are they measuring their, not only their diversity, but their inclusion efforts? What does their retention efforts look like? You know, do women come in, cool, you have like 50% women in your company, but if they're only in one certain role and they only leave after a year and not in leadership, that should be a red flag. For me and my, my current company, and um, I, I talk about Hulu a lot. I, I, I'm sorry for my LinkedIn post always being about them, but they, I feel like they've done it really well. They've really modeled great behavior for me because like they measure those things. They care about like what's going on, how to fix things if there are a discrepancy. Um, and so there's like those two components. And I think you know, as a data community, I think we really need to be mindful of that and like really push, like we, we're these data people, we know how to bring up these metrics, right? How can we push to bring that? But for the individual people affected, yes, there's actions we have to take to, to kind of survive and be in a space, but it's not on us to fix this larger system. Um, it, it really takes the whole company to really shift that and actually value that. Thanks a lot for that, Mark. Appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, like I, I ask this quite frequently of many of the women who come onto, onto my show, just ask them to share their experiences as a woman in data science. Um, so definitely if, if you get an opportunity, go listen to some of their advice. There's a ton of advice there, but let's see if, if, if Kristen or Asha would you guys like to, to uh, come in. 
Tom, go for it. I was just going to say, Vivian, I was teasing you at the beginning, but I really do enjoy the tough questions you bring to this group, honestly. And um, I wanted to explore deeper. You don't have to get specific, but it it's specific. Your specific frustration is when you're trying to ambitiously get ahead. You feel like it's harder for you than for the guy next to you. Yes, I have to always be better. Like, and this isn't even about like data science necessarily. Like, agreed. I mean, I started college when I was 15. Okay, I finished my two-year degree before I finished high school, and I went to graduate school when I was 20. Okay, and it's like never been good enough. I read hundreds of books per year. Last year, I read 200 books. Like, I I read, I study, I like. It's, I, I want to be the very best. And then there's also this social expectation of like, but don't talk about it. Like, don't like brag about yourself. It comes off as like uncomfortable, you know? And then like a lot of people like lash out in insecurity. I've found that like, I've had like male managers and stuff who are kind of sucky managers, like, you know, whatever. But they, I find that they'll like lash out at me and punish me basically when they feel like I'm smarter than them. And like, I don't know, just, so many times when I've had a boss like straight up steal my ideas or my my work that I've like done for the team. And then we go to the meeting to present it. And then he says, oh, here's all the work I did. And like, oh, just pisses me off. Like I, and I even had, I even had a boss and a coworker, two middle-aged men mansplain to me menopause. We were like, I don't even know why that's appropriate at the workplace, but we were like discussing a woman who had gotten pregnant and I made some comment of like, I, I, don't, I don't even know what the comment was, but like apparently she was older. And so they like felt the need to stop and explain to me how menopause works. And so it was like, oh, it just angers me so much of like, why, why do these people do this? It's so like, why, why, why can't I just be, I don't know. I'm, I'm just ranting now because I'm just mad. So please, please be, please be patient with me. As I say this, I want to preface it before I start. I do think that what you're explaining is harder for women, but the same thing does happen to men to a lesser degree. I think, by the way, I am not negating at all that it's because you're a woman. I've, I get very frustrated when I see people treat my wife differently on one of our family matters than me. Um, but I've witnessed this for myself and others. In other words, I'm trying to say, I think we can all benefit from this discussion, but we should remain sensitive that women get it worse. I've actually, it took me a while to actually even... I'm embarrassed to say this, Vivian. It took me a while to even see that, uh, honestly, that that women suffer in these regards more. Um, it it's amazing the spectrum of individuals we encounter in life. I don't want to oversimplify this, Vivian, but I think uh, people are so freaking insecure across the board at different levels that they're grasping for anything they can get sometimes. And uh, yeah, they'll steal your work. I don't know, maybe that guy thought, you know, he'd inspired you to do that and you were just doing what he thought. Of course, I know. I, I'm thinking of some specific cases for myself and can't imagine how much worse they would have been for you. But I remember this bully at one company I worked at. And frankly, I had gotten in a habit of thinking it was just me. But then I found out, oh, no, there were a lot of people suffering from this guy's toxicity. And it was worse for some of the women. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, um, I don't know if anything I just shared was helpful at all, Vivian. Uh, I just want to say I empathize. Yeah, it's very, I mean, like, I'm super, super, like, bummed that you feel this way, dude. Like, I mean, it, it sucks. Um, I mean, if if... Tor, if you want to chime in, I saw Makiko came in. I would love to have Makiko provide you with some advice as well, because she always uh, kicks ass at this type of stuff. 
Go for it. Uh, all I can say, Vivian, is that I've definitely been there. Um, an example, many years ago, I developed a budget model for a company. Uh, my manager stole my idea, and it's the opposite. It was actually a woman. Now, this, to me, yeah, there is some discrepancies in the workplace. And yeah, women generally have to perform more harder to achieve. But this is the commonality in the workplace. I've found you know, many instances, and finally I was able to leave the corporate world because the politics, I'm not a politician, unfortunately. You know, I can only take so much bullshit at the coffee machine, but then I need to get back to work. And a lot of people will take that as a criticism. And it's like, what I always say is that most people, some people are always say, don't work so hard because you make me look bad. So you are actually indirectly creating an atmosphere where people feel threatened because you actually perform. And, and the one thing you never have to let happen is to allow these people to get to you. You are you. And at the end of the day, my dad gave me one advice, don't look for your job look for your boss because that is if you can't work with your boss you have no future in that company it doesn't matter how hard you work how much you do you will never get anywhere because you do not have that support and to work for that support it, there is a point where you have to say to yourself it's not worth it anymore because it's affecting you as a person and not them and remember these people they will move on move on i live by one rule what goes around comes around. That's how I justify that these people have better pay, better jobs, get promotions, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, they will face themselves one day and that's when they will have the problem. Uh, Vin, let's hear from you. And then after Vin, we'll go to Craig. And then Makiko, if you'd like to, to jump in. I think, <clears throat> and this is hard because I think more of us need to say this. I failed. I've been in this field for 25 years and this is where we are. I mean, this is where we are right now. Is it better? No, no, it still sucks. I mean, you can point to a couple of points. Sure. Awesome. We made a couple of points. That's not better. And I think it needs to be said more. I failed. I mean, yeah, did I try? It doesn't matter. I failed. We're still here. We still have this problem. And I don't think we get past it until more of us just, I failed. What I did didn't work. What I've tried didn't work. Uh, you know, it, it didn't. And that's the, that's the only conclusion you can come to by looking and listening to all the stories that are out there, especially right now. You know, it doesn't matter that I'm not quite in that middle age group yet, or I'm not quite one of the most senior. I, I've had my chance. I failed. And I'm sorry. I, I, I think we need to say that more. And when you failed, just start listening. And so, you know, obviously I can't fix a systemic problem, but talking to people like me, it, you have to at least come out and say, I failed. And then start listening and just do the stuff other people tell you to do. Listen, you know, don't try to do something else. And I find a lot of companies do this where, you know, you'll be told specifically, like, don't make me feel uncomfortable. And here are three ways that you are making me feel uncomfortable. And then they go do five other things. It's like, whoa, whoa, no, 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 stop. Listen to what people are telling you to do and just do it. And I, you know, I wish there was a magic button that was going to make this better in the next five to 10 years, but I've studied this and the numbers in data science, it's one in four, that's women, one in four. If you are in any one of the minority or protected classes, it's worse than that. Like it actually is worse. If you can believe it, that, it's, it's abysmal. And there's no movement. Like that needle is not moving forward at anything you would think was a, you know, an acceptable pace. And so I think, like I said, we got to say what we're doing right now isn't working. It isn't. Let's stop. Let's start listening to people who are telling us that, this is what we need and actually start doing it. Mikigo. 
Oh, uh, I'll, I'll go after Greg, actually, because I'm, I'm looking oh, up the yeah. resource. That was that was really good. Um, but yeah, I'll go after Greg and then I can bring it up. Yeah, definitely. Greg, go for it. And Vivian, let us know if this is, is helping you make, you know, feel better at all. Yeah. Let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Vivian, as soon as I, I, I heard I heard it, 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 you know, my heart goes out to you and I can I can certainly relate. Um, and for someone who uh, comes from the Caribbean and had a hard time, you know, fitting in. Uh, I totally, totally relate to 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 this. Um, you know, I've been in situations where people have asked me to, you know, give give my reports or data to someone else to double check that it's true. I've had, you know, my boss tell me, "Oh, I don't believe in what what you what you're giving me right now. I, I want somebody else to take a look at it," it and it it really sucks. Um, you know just because of my accent somebody thought that you know i should ask you know the fact that i asked many questions too many questions uh they thought that i didn't get it i didn't understand it uh on top of that um I, I, i'm black right so in america and you know here's what i do in 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 and i think you are you are way way beyond that too is uh that mindset you have right there is to find people who align with you, like your vision and help you push forward. You are well equipped enough to spot the ones who will not align with you, who will not push you forward. So with that, once you identify them, start thinking about a way to align with the ones who can give you a boost. Surround yourself with them. So if it's your manager who's not giving you that boost, now think about the next steps. How do you go around that? Because that person might be a blocker in your life and figure out a way to move around and, and be smarter, outsmart people. You, you're going to have to do that. And now, another piece too, to build on what Vin was saying, the first step is to acknowledge the issue exists. That is perfect. The, the, the key to bring this home is to become an advocate. Th that's what to me I see missing is that we say, yes, it exists. What do we do about it now? How do you become a manager now who elevates your team? Women, men, no matter what. Now you become an advocate. We change things by becoming an advocate one at a time. So if us men, we realize that there is an issue for women, let's become an advocate one at a time. That, that to me is the key to change it. And, and it spreads. Right, forget politics. So that's the way I can I can say it. I can see it. And, and for any issue, deep issue that 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 is going on inside and outside of work. So with that, um, Vivian, you find an advocate. You can spread the word. You can infect others, right? So the ones who don't advocate for you, you move away from them. It's a big world. There will be somebody out there who wants to help you out. This group wants to help you out. So. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, can I say something before Makiko goes? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I just want to say that, like, I don't know. It's great. I, part of why I brought this up is also just that I want people to know that it's, like, happening. It's real. Like, I'm experiencing it. I'm, I'm a real person here in front of you. It's happening to me. And I'm sure that lots of you also know that, too. But just in general, like... I don't know, notice, stop and notice things. Like that's one of the reasons that I bring this up is like, sure, I'm feeling pretty angry about it right now, but like, um, just, just to notice, you know, because once you start noticing, like whenever, even like with this group, you know, that was one of the first things I thought when I started coming here is like counting, like how many women were here, how many minorities were here, you know, like it, it made a difference to me that Harper, you are like a person of color leading this, like, you know, I noticed those things and that's something that I find encouraging. So yeah, like, you know, even just when you walk in a room to, to have a meeting or whatever, like notice, you know, how many, how many people who are not like you are in this room? Yeah, man, absolutely agree with you because I try to make it a real effort to get as much diversity in terms of guests on the podcast as possible because yeah, I mean, outside looking in, it's just dudes and I mean, mostly Indian dudes and Asian dudes, but, you know, dudes nonetheless. Um, but, yeah, uh, Makiko, go for it. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, it's funny, like, it, 
So as someone who, who didn't like go the traditional route and all that, um, and also being like a queer Asian woman, but I, I don't present as that, right? I think a lot of times I come off as just being like, uh, I don't know, vanilla or whatever, vanilla Asian, I don't know. Um, you know, but yeah, I mean, first off, I mean, like, uh, just from what I'm picking up on the context, like I've totally had stuff like that happen. Um, and it's like hard too, right? Because like I've had instances too, like, for example, I'm talking to some coworkers and like, I find out that people, for example, think I got the job because my hiring manager is into like Japanese women or, you know, I, I go to like conferences, I get hit on by like some of the managers. They're like, oh, I really love the way your like pants look on you. It's like, are you looking that closely? Aren't you supposed to be looking at the details on like the PowerPoint slide? Right. So, um, you know, all, yeah, all sorts of like nonsense, you know. Um, so, so I posted a link because it's something that I think about a lot, right, is uh, this concept of exit and voice, you know. So if you come on, like if you have a situation that's like uncomfortable, I mean, there's two ways to do it. You can kind of like, you can either like raise your voice uh, or you can kind of like exit, you know? Um, now, a lot of times that's really kind of hard. I've been in a lot of situations where I just could not leave a job because like financially it's just not doable, right? Um, you know, so there's, so a lot of ways, it, sometimes it feels like there isn't really a lot of options. So, you know, there's the chance to kind of change the environment around you, but then there's also kind of the chance to like, I don't want to say change your reaction or response to it, um, because frankly, that's not your responsibility. That is a responsibility on the person who is like making the environment an uncomfortable place to be and the manager who is not raising up their team. Um, you know, but something that kind of helps me feel better is like, first off, um, in terms of like the advocates and the allies, I spent a lot of time doing uh, work for uh, organizations like Lesbians Who Tech uh, and Women Who Code um, because there's a lot of people like me, like you, who, you know, we're trying to make our way into like data science and machine learning. A lot of times we run up against uh, the sort of like measuring contest, you know, um, that comes off as like microaggressions or actually sometimes macroaggressions, right? Um, let's be honest, sometimes they're, they're not that micro. Um, so I spent a lot of time there, like building relationships there as well, um, doing a lot of work um, wherever I can with sort of other organizations who maybe for example, focus on like, Black Lives Matter, looking at the impact of COVID on like how it's exacerbated by like uh, racist policies and all that. I try to build build allies and bridges among other groups because the reality is that like I don't think a lot of times I can always change the person I'm interacting who is causing those microaggressions. It's nice to raise it, um, so that's helped me. Um, you know, but part of it too is as much as possible with a lot of like my male allies, if they're open to the conversation. Like I also do try to educate there. Um, because I think for, for even with my partner, right. Who's, who's male, um, we've had conversations where we talk about scenarios where he's like, oh, well, you know, I thought he was like, I, I was just treating her like one of the boys. And I'm like, well, I don't think first off, you should be treating one of the boys like that. Um, but also you should maybe think of it as like a professional work workspace, you know, where your goal as a manager is to just make it a safe environment. Um, so I know none of that like really helps, frankly, at the end of the day, it like, it like sucks. <laughs> and there's been a lot of times where like I've, which has caused me to kind of like, you know, move on to the next opportunity or leave because I'm like, look, if you're not going to treat me my value, um, then I don't have to deal with this stuff. And that's where uh, coming, like having personal leverage really, really helps. So whether it's like hustling um, and like, you know, there's a bunch of people here, right? Like uh, Joe, Greg, Mark, Vin, um, Matt, Obviously, Harpreet, uh, I'm trying to think, see who else is on like Thomas Ives, right? Everyone here is doing some kind of like hustle. Um, and that really helps. It helps build your leverage and capital so that you can like leave situations like that. Um, or even just basically sometimes uh, being able to go into a meeting and kindly kind of push back on that person and go, no, I ain't going to take this shit. Um, so that kind of helps me a lot. And so I spent a lot of time on um, some of the subreddits that like encourage like the women in independent finance and all that. But um, but I hear your point, right? Which is that like, as women, it should not always be up to us to be educating like our male counterparts on like what is considered safe, appropriate behavior. And that is true for like everything, you know? So all I can say is, you know, like been there, got through it. I, I do what I can to educate and communicate. 
But a lot of times for me, my superpower has just been building up enough leverage so I can say like, bye. So not sure that any of that helped. I'm also hungry, so I'm just gonna go back to eating. Uh, no, I really liked a lot of things you said. And it was reminding me also, Mark made a comment in the chat of just how, how hard it is when you're the person being discriminated against that you don't have a lot of the, you know, capital to be like, hey, you know, cause if you're being discriminated against, if you're in a situation where you're being discriminated against and, and then you try to speak up, then oftentimes it can just make people hate you more, you know? Yeah, and that's where Greg's like advice about the um, adv advocates, like that really, really helps because I had some certain, I had some sort of like gnarly situations like at different companies I've been at around like harassment, sexism. And I'm gonna be honest, HR was kind of useless there, um, which is unfortunate, but, um, and that's not, not to say HR was useless, but what really helped me was I had like, I had allies and advocates in the senior level above those managers who were doing that nonsense. And like, I hate to say it, but at the end of the day, like, uh, it's all, it's kind of like about p power and hierarchy. It really is that Machiavellian kind of like, you know, who do you know that, and like how much power do they have to like influence the situation? It would help if we had more women, people of color, LGBTQ in the, in the leadership ranks. Obviously that helps kind of sort of pull everyone up, but um, like Greg's advice there, it, it's really super key because it'll also help to like, something that um, I thought was really insane that I learned from one of my jobs was when uh, my business partner said like, look, deals are never made at the boardroom. Like that's the common sort of idea is that like, oh, like people go into suits and then they go into the boardroom and then they do the presentation, hammer out the deal. Um, but actually what, what, what really happens is like, you have these like kind of like side conversations or things that happen outside the boardroom. that are sort of like the, uh, whatever right like they have like the the conversations happen with the people who are in power and then the boardroom is just kind of like the perform the performative exhibition of like that power and influence and so that's where that ally and advocacy stuff really really helps can i okay. can i add something real quick yeah definitely then after that let's hear from nisha and then we'll go to Joe and then Vin again. Go for it, Mark. Perfect. Um, I just want to add some like an actual step that people who, I, who don't identify as women can take to be allies. And please correct me if you think this is the wrong approach. It's something I've I've used and talked to my colleagues who identify as women. But first, like one notice, like Vivian said, like take chance and notice if you're seeing like people their ideas being stolen or like not being talked to, especially in, like meeting settings. Pay attention, and then if you have that rapport with them, go talk and be like, hey, I noticed this BS happening. You know, is it okay if I like, like try to amplify your voice or like do something where you feel comfortable doing that? And then when you're in a meeting, you can be really subtle about it. So if someone steals uh, a woman's idea, you can literally be like, oh, that was a really cool point. Harpreet, I'm just gonna choose you not intentionally. Hey, cool. that was a really cool Har uh, point, Harpreet. I remember Vivian saying something really similar for her work e earlier. Um, Vivian, can you tell me your perspective on this as well? So it's like a really subtle like redirect to like bring the attention back to them. Or you can be like, hey, uh, Vivian, I, I didn't hear you talking in the meeting. I know you worked a lot on this. Like, could you, could you please tell me more what, what your thoughts are? Like, going actively, like, bringing them into the conversation, but in a really subtle way. Um, but the key thing is, like, having rapport with them and talking ahead of time so it doesn't feel like you're, like, singling them out or anything like that. Um, but that's strategies I've used before. Um, and that's what people, I, like, when I've had rapport with where I've noticed that BS happening. I really, really like that, Mark. Thank you so much. That's phenomenal. I like that that idea. Let's hear from Nisha on this topic. Then Nisha will go to Joe and then Vin. Um, hey, Vivian, I, I'm quite with you. I have, I've been there and I have experienced both in the academic setting and in the industry setting, a similar thing. Um, in the academic setting, what happened was uh, it was a qualifying exam that I'm supposed to give. This happened a couple of years back. And the professor actually said, I have two kids at that, uh, I had two kids at that time. And they, he said, if you have two kids, how are you gonna do your PhD? That was pretty much the question that he asked me in a qualifying exam, in a closed room exam. And there are only three other professors who were there in that room. It's not being recorded, it's not being done anything. So 
he he's asking that and the rest of the professors one of who was a female she did uh, support me and she she uh, the end result was essentially the guy who asked me that question he failed me on the qualifying exam but the other three passed me but i have to get a four pass otherwise it's a conditional pass and that's what happened in that qualifying exam uh, so I, I really understand what you're going through because me, what I did at that point was I quit the program. I just graduated with my master's, didn't do my PhD just because of that one guy who affected me so much. So like Mikiko said, there are two ways to go about it. One is to, I don't have to take your shit, just move on. And the other is to fight back. At that point in time, I was so emotional that I just decided I, I'm not gonna take your shit. And I graduated with my master's with another professor. And then I'm currently pursuing my PhD. So I did, I did not give up on my dream though. I just put it for later. I worked for a couple of years in data, in the industry. And then I picked up my PhD again and I'm, I'm close to graduation now. So hopefully that helps you and gives you courage to pick whichever option you want to. And the other thing is, same thing happens in the industry as well. I do work as an analyst in a state government job currently uh, while pushing my PhD on the side. So what I do in situations like this where the managers take credit for whatever I'm doing, I subtly insert, like Mark said, ask questions during that meeting that I know he cannot answer because I did the groundwork, right? So that's one way to go about it as well. And I have learned this along the way to have those subtle marks as to how to ask questions that would impress, that would actually be meaningful for the audience. And at the same time, the manager who is taking credit for all the work cannot really answer that question. So he will have to defer the question to me. And that, that time I insert my own uh, I guess words saying, uh, this is how I did. So that kind of subtly imp impresses on the audience that uh, I did the work. And I've I've seen both ways. Some In some cases it does work. And the people who actually take the next step, they come back to me rather than my manager. So they send the email to me directly asking for further research on it or further uh, steps that needs to be taken on it. So that's from an industry standpoint, but I'm with you and this happens, it's the real world. So it, it happens all the time. And me being an Asian uh, Indian, it's, it's worse for me. Uh, Indian woman, it's, it's really worse. And uh, it's a hassle, but I'm getting better at it. I hope that helps. Thank you very so much. Help Nisha. you make your decision. Thank you very much for sharing that, Nisha. Um, let's go up to uh, Kristen actually next, and Asha, if you'd like to go after Christian, let me know, and then, dudes, I'll get I'll get to you, dudes, later. All right, go for it. Um, so I just wanted to say, of course, this has happened to me too. I think where I notice it is the subtleness of lower expectations, and that's what I kind of wanted to speak about. Um, before entering this field, I was a teacher and um, one of the most important things that they talked about was the power of our expectations on our students. They actually did a study um, where they handed a group of students, a group of kiddos, and they said, these are the highest performing kids in the second grade and they are amazing. And because the teacher expected them to do better, they did do better. It had no, they were just regular randomly chosen students. And so when I'm thinking about this, I think the real power and danger lies in those male you know, leaders and managers who don't expect more. If you expect less, you get less. And you know, it has a really dangerous negative cycle. Um, so I think that it's really important for anyone on this call as a manager, as a male, to expect more, expect the highest level from all of your female staff, all of your staff, really. But I just think, you know, when we're having this conversation, it, it really tied into me um, that study and how truly powerful the person in charge of you 
um, is in, in determining and like affecting um, your performance level, uh, whether it was in the classroom and I think can directly be applied to the workforce. Thank you very much for sharing that, Kristen. Yeah, it's like that, uh, the tyranny of soft expectations or whatever it is, bigotry of low expectations from these guys. It's, uh, it's not cool. Asha, would you like to go? Um, I'm, I've experienced the same thing at work, but that was early on, like one of the first jobs I had. But for some reason, moving on, I've been lucky enough to have a boss who... I haven't had this situation at work a lot of the times. One thing, but one thing I learned is you need to speak up on it when it's happening, especially when someone is getting credit for your work. You need to speak up on it when it's happening. A lot of the times that was the hard part. I had to learn very quickly because I used to let things slide and talk about it later. But moving forward, I, I've been lucky enough. I don't think I've had that problem. I've had very understanding bosses, if I'll call it that or I've just dodged the bullet for now. Thank you very much for sharing that experience, Asha. Um, so Joe, would you like to, uh, to... Yeah, I think a lot of people have said some awesome things and you know, it kind of pisses me off that we have to talk about this kind of stuff in this day and age, right? I mean, where the fuck are all the guys standing up for the women in the companies, you know? We all, we all say, you know, it, it, it's irritating in, in some ways. And, and I fault myself for this too. But, you know, I actually, you know, I, Matt knows me. I, I usually say something if I see something uh, not working out. Usually, uh, I usually err on the side of being overly blunt with people. Um, but, I mean, you know, I was, I was just chatting with, with Matt on Slack about this. It's crazy. This is, a, this is the same shit that I've had to see throughout my career for over 20 years now. You know, women, minorities, even just, you know, I would say, you know, men who may have maybe of a, uh, you know, a weaker disposition, maybe, right? Just getting trampled on by other other people. There's just bullying all across the board. And like, where are we men when women are being treated this way? We all, we've all seen this in our careers. You know, uh, if you haven't, um, no, maybe you haven't actually, I'm making a pretty big assumption, but point being, um, you know, there's, and what can we do? You know the, the the you know the the men in this in this uh, world to to make things better for for people like Vivian right who have to go to work and they, and she's really frustrated feels like she's getting bullied feels feels like she's not getting heard feels like all of her work's being stolen from her and isn't getting the recognition or the or the respect the basic respect that a person deserves in the workplace you know I mean how, what kind of company is that where you can't where you can go to where you, where you go to work and you don't feel like you can contribute anything where you feel like if you, if you open your mouth your ideas are just going to get stolen from you, right? And you feel like you're, you're less invaluable, not not just as an employee, but as a human being. Like that's fucked up. But that's that's the world that you know a lot of a lot of people have to work in right now. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but I, I have a suspicion that you know we've we've been talking the same platitudes for decades. It's getting better. I think it's great that people like Vivian and Makiko and others and everybody else, you know, all the, all the women in this group can actually like, you know, have a voice now and, and talk about this stuff. I think in an open forum, I think 10 years ago, that probably wasn't the case. Um, 20 years ago, certainly not. Right. So I'm, I'm glad that at least people are talking about this, but then we talk, what are we going to do about it? Right. Yeah, absolutely. If you see, if you see like some manager, some, some dude uh, pulling that kind of stuff on Vivian, are you going to tell that guy, you know, what's on your mind? Or are you going to sit there and just, you know, pretend it didn't happen and be quiet and continue, uh, you know, that, that trend that's been going on for, I, I think, way too damn long. Yeah. I mean, so. no one's going to, no one, if, if no one's going to fire you for doing the wrong thing. So just speak up. You see some shit going on, dude, just like speak up. And if they do end up firing you for doing the right thing, then that probably is a shitty place to work for. Fuck Anyways. that place, dude. Yeah. I mean, I posted a link here. It talked about the Bozo event horizon. I mean, for God's sake, this, this is like encompasses a lot of companies at a certain point, you get enough Bozos in there. Like what's the point in working there? Like your, your career pro progression is probably going to be stunted anyway. Like in, these people aren't going to help you. And there's plenty of other, I would say, enlightened companies coming up where, you know, your talents, um, you know, might be of a better use, but, you know, it, 
but you not supporting these types of companies too, um, and other smart people, I think takes the oxygen out of the room. And these companies just wither and die, and these, you know, dumb shit uh, people. I don't know what happens to them, but at least you don't get to work with them. So that's my rant. Thanks for listening to my TED talk. So. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, Vin, let's go to Vin, and then after Vin, we'll go John Sebastian. After John Sebastian, we'll hear from Tom. But in the meantime, if anybody else wants to chime in, please do let me know. Absolutely, we'll add you to the queue. I should have said this last time, but <clears throat> pick the quality of your advocate because everyone has like a, a red line where they can't go any further or they get fired. And so when you're looking for advocates, look for like my last corporate gig and the culture there was one of the reasons why I don't do like I don't do jobs anymore. But my team was the only one that was 50-50 male, female. It was the only one. I mean, I had the only two non-white people it was, that was it. And so I was actually able to, anytime I saw somebody that was getting bullied, I was able to go and pull that person into my team and just say, Hey, why don't you believe me? I got tons of work. Why don't you come work with me? So find advocates that can actually do something for you and are willing to do something for you. Like I had the ability in my position to just build out my team and bring in whoever I wanted to. And, you know, if you were miserable in another role, I was more than happy to have you. So like I said, look at the people who are actually doing something, you know, not just, hey, that's not good. That's not enough. You know, you can't, you can't just wag a finger and expect anything to get better. But look for advocates that are actually doing things working and find advocates that are zero filter, because that's my other problem. I have the reason why I'm, again, not corporate is because I have no filter. And for some reason, that works really well in the C-suite, but everywhere else that's highly discouraged. And so when I got mad about something, like people didn't want me in that room when I was angry about something. And so if you brought a problem to me, I was that person that they didn't want to come and bring that up to their boss. So also find that person with zero filter because in engineering, there's tons of us with anger issues and no filter. Yeah, man, absolutely love it. Um, I, that was, never mind, I'm not gonna share this story here uh, on this public forum. Uh, because it's it's too recent, but uh, John Sebastian, go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to add something, and actually, um, so it might be it may sound a little bit uh, unrelated to what you were saying, but still, I I feel that as a Caucasian male, you know, we do have our own responsibility in that. And interestingly enough, so a month ago, you know, there was this situation that happened in, in Atlanta. And my partner is Asian and we were discussing the, you know, the whole situation, you know, how awful it was. And I remember, you know, thinking that it was obviously awful what happened. You know, I'm definitely pro diversity, obviously. Um, but there's something that I just can't fully understand. And it's not because I, it's not because I don't want to, it's just because I've, I will never experience, uh, the level of uh, of discrimination or the the feeling that you are in the part of the minority constantly. Um, I remember we went to some like uh, you know uh, I would say like counties in which you know I was the only uh, white dude, and you know at some point even if I was not surrounded you know by criminals, I was just like normal people. Uh, it's just it feel you feel so much disconnected from your own reality that you feel you start feeling insecure, and that's basically what she was trying to tell me by you know by by when my girlfriend sorry it feels like a, a, it it's, it really does feel like a, I'm not making much sense but my girlfriend was trying to tell me that you know the whole situation in Atlanta uh, that you know it was way worse than just you know just another situation that you know she felt like very angered by by the everything and i was like of course i understand but the truth is that i i can't really fully understand because i'm not the one who's going outside you know being asian and walking among men caucasian men all the time feeling completely uh, feeling like the minority like 24 hours a day so that being said, the, the only thing that I wanted to say really with, with this story is that, you know, if you're a man and you're pro-diversity, I mean, support whatever uh, is, is coming to you, uh, but don't, don't pretend that you fully understand, support it, 
and just go with it. Because ultimately, I mean, you don't, you don't really understand what it is. And that was my acknowledgement with my partner is that, you know what, I, you, you know, I get that I don't get everything. And that's why I want you to feel more comfortable. And that's why I'm going to protect you uh, even more from now on. So it's just what I wanted to add, actually. Thank you very much, John Sebastian. Uh, Tom. And Viv Vivian, sorry, I saw you're unmuted there for a second. Go for it. Um, I just wanted to add kind of what off of um, John was saying there that, um, you know, something that has angered me in the past before when I've tried to like speak up or push back more is that you get a lot of like shit from people being like, why do you always got to like take it to that place of like feminism? Why does it always have to be like that for you? And it's like, because I don't have the luxury of forgetting. I don't have the luxury of like taking up this cause for a day or two and being like, yeah, and then and then getting tired of it and putting it down. Like, this is my reality, you know? And I'm sure that lots of people feel that way. Like, you know, Greg, like every single day has to go to a workplace or live in the world in which he is black and has an accent and like have people, you know, belittle him for that. And like in his every interaction, you know? So like, he doesn't have the luxury of like putting that down and taking up the cause when he feels like it, you know? So I guess that's just something I wanted to add. Absolutely. And um, Tom, go for it. And I mean, look guys, I, I hope this is, uh, hope this is helpful to Vivian. If, if you know, if any, any point you, you just reach out to me at any point, just so, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, if you ever need to reach out to me, I'm, I'm there for you, but Tom, go for it. No, I'm, I'm really glad we're talking about this. And uh, Vivian, I want to check in with you on something. I'm guessing we haven't really come up with any great solutions. It just helps to have some empathy. Is that accurate? Yeah, I guess that, you know, it's hard for all us people in this, you know, Zoom room to figure out how to solve this like global problem but it is nice just to talk about it, see the other, you know, that I'm not alone, that other people like see it too, that I'm not crazy, you know, because that happens a lot too, is that people try to make you like feel like, oh, you're just making too big of an issue of it or something. Like you're trying to like see things that aren't there. So like, I'm glad to also have this like grounding moment with it too, of like other people see it, I'm not crazy. Like you have empathy for me and you're gonna like, even even if just the people in this room just say, you know what, today starting now, I'm gonna be better. I'm gonna be more aware. Like, I think that is helpful. So I had another question and it's to you and the other women and really to anyone else who's felt some type of I don't know what to call it anymore. I'll call it bozoism. Thanks, Joe. Um, when you face it, when you confront it, does it make it worse? Or does it sometimes work to confront it? I, I sympathize with what Makiko is pointing out that, well, uh, it's risky. And, you know, I've got my golden handcuffs on right now. I don't have another option yet. I'm just curious how everyone's feeling. I remember um, I was going through something. I don't know how big it was in comparison to y'all, but I finally stood up to my manager and uh, I'm so naive. I went to a friend that I seek counseling from during this time. And he said, oh man, you got him scared for these reasons. And I went, I wasn't even threatening him. Oh, you mean you meant that towards someone? Yes. And it, sorry, I know I'm being confusing. I'd said something that really scared my manager, like I was going to turn him in for something. I was talking about another individual that was affecting the situation, but I'd failed to communicate clearly. Anyway, I finally stood up, but I think I just got lucky. If I had stand, stood up any other way, Vivian, I think it might have just hurt me. And I'm just wondering, those of you that have stood up to these situations, how often did it come off okay? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And sorry, I, I didn't mean to. Yeah. I'm just curious because I, I feel frustrated with this talk in a way. Yeah, oh, definitely. And um, let me, uh, Mikiko, I'll get to you after I turn the floor over here to Asha. Um, but Mikiko, when you do get a chance to, to get on air, tell us about some of these organizations you had mentioned in the chat as well. Asha, go for it. 
from my experience, I found that speaking up helped, but it's different for, for everyone. You deal with different people, it might go differently. For my sister, it went differently. But for me, after I spoke up and consistently kept at it, I found that the more I spoke up, the more I challenged the status quo, the more comfortable I became, the more respect I got. For me, it worked. But for some people, it might not work. It might aggravate the whole situation. But for me, it went very well. I spoke up when I saw it happening. I spoke up right there and then. I didn't let it pass. And I did it consistently, consistently, consistently that I found things changed. They had to change. If they didn't change, I'd consistently speak up on it till the day I leave the, the company and go to somewhere else. I'd still consistently speak up on it. And it changed for me. Kiko? Yeah, so I think, so it, it, it like it, honestly, it just depends on the moral character of the person um, and the company. Um, so for example, so I, I worked at this one startup, right? That um, was started in, in uh, Tel Aviv, um, but they had a San Francisco office. And there, I think a lot of times there, there were moments of miscommunication, um, but I think that came out of the fact that like, and like my Israeli colleagues were telling me this, you know, they're saying that like, oh, you know, Americans are very soft in how they speak and how they communicate. And for them, it was like, they're like, we want you to get to the point and we want you to just like get there, right? And we want you to just ask. So there it was kind of like, like I had to learn how to like advocate for myself in a uh, like cross cultural environment. Right, like I had to sort of kind of adapt the way I was operating to the way they were operating just because it, it and it and it was funny because I had a few meetings with like some of my, my male Israeli colleagues and I, I remember going like man these guys are rude and then of course like I, then I was working with the director of finance who's a woman and she was the exact same way and and it was funny I was like she said to me she's like you know she's like I like you she's like you're very direct for an American I'm like okay okay uh, so maybe I see what's going on here, right? Um, so there, for example, I think it was not um, it was not a case of uh, of like someone just intentionally uh, trying to be rude or trying to sort of fulfill their own kind of insecurities. It was just literally like we had to just like kind of code switch on some of the stuff. Um, so there, I think it it worked out fine. Um, but like I've had some more extreme circumstances, right? Where I worked at this one company, and you know I was like harassed for six months and it caused me extreme like mental harm to the point where, you know, I had to go get like therapy for like, I had PTSD, like all this other stuff, you know? And it was interesting because, you know, I thought my story was sort of very isolated, but then I, I, I started building adv advocates and allies. And then they were, what they were telling me was that first off it happened to a lot of women. Um, and it was, I think it was really a company culture issue right because then around that time they had like this anonymous letter anonymously signed whatever by like 40 people who had said like look we had experienced this at the company and so there i think it was this there's like permissiveness in the system which allowed for a lack of individual accountability and for some of those individuals they were like they were never going to like apologize right so i think it just it, it really depends on like where that person is coming from are they you know do are they doing it intentionally um, you know, do they like have something to prove? Um, and I mentioned like, there's like, I had a story, right? Like I had this one interview where like this guy, like I had kind of tr started treating him as an equal in an interview. He didn't like that. So I had tried to sort of modulate. It was like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, uh, maybe I don't understand the, the definition of logistic regression. Could, could you please, you know, educate me? And for that person, like I, I can kind of like, I could get a sense to like, okay, if I'm gonna have to work with this person, um this might be what like but apparently they loved the interview it wasn't even that like they're like oh yeah it doesn't jive they're like oh yeah this was a great interview and i'm like mm, mm, no no we ain't doing this so it it just depends you know sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't um at the end of the day i feel like uh you can't always trust that it's going to work out you, you just have to have like you just have to have leverage like that's what i feel like for some people that's what they respect is how much power and leverage you have uh, and for others, it's just, you know, if you can kind of like educate, but, you know, that's kind of my sense. But yeah, I mean, like I, I mentioned some orgs like, you know, in the chat. And what I found is that sometimes it's just 
I've had to like build those allies in some of these environments uh, just because it's a lot less, a lot less bull, you know? So, yeah. So real quick, like that, that leverage, ha talk to us about that concept of leverage in a role when we feel like we're in a situation where like, you know, Vivian is, how, how can we, how can we find points of leverage and what would that, what would that look like? So we can identify that whenever we come across it. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I, and I, I'll just say one little bit, and I feel like there are other people on this call actually, who could even talk more about leverage. Um, like one form of leverage is just like personal financial capital. So I have this one coworker had this one coworker cause I had a different job, right? He's still there, but, um, you know, he was doing work. So he, he just, first off, he's a, he's a, an experienced professional in the data science ML space. He's been doing, uh, machine learning research for 20 years, but he was, he's doing like corporate dashboards and like financial benchmarking. And we would all look at him and we're like, what is going on here? Like, why are you here? <laughs> right. And so for him, he's, he's got a house in Palo Alto fully paid up. He's got cash. He says he makes more money on the weekends doing like crypto just for funsies. Um, so he's just there. So he's like, so he, so we asked him, we're like, at what point do you decide you no longer want to take it? He's like, I can wake up the next day and decide I don't want to do this. And he's like, I just go and like, I go help out with one of my buddies with their companies, right? That's some like, that's that's like, there's that's leverage. But it's leverage in the form of both uh, professional capital, right? Because he's had a number of years of working for both my, uh, I'm not gonna say the names, for a bunch of the FANG companies doing re really senior research, right? So that kind of, there's that professional capital which is that he can go get a new job, but he he also has that network capital. He has those relationships. And there's a book called, I think, uh, Never Eat Alone or something. Like, uh, yeah. And I think that book talks about it. There's another book, Your Net Worth is Your Network. That's another good one. Um, so you have professional, you have uh, your relationships, and then you have financial. Um, Ramit Sethi, he talks about this tripod of stability where he says you need kind of like three points in your life to uh well insurance stability but to give you kind of that pivot power to be able to make those decisions um and that's just kind of how i approach things because and it, if you think about like your job title for example like uh, years ago it was data scientist now it's data analyst data scientist ml engineer ml research right the the titles change but your body of work and your experiences those keep being pulled forward i mean everyone here probably has had like you know has had like maybe eight to 10 different titles just, just by function of the industry changing so much, you know, but your body of work, the relationships that you build, um, you know, that you kind of just take with you like forward. So that's at least how I think about it. I think about it both as my arsenal of, you know, what can I, can I just, can I exit the situation? Um, and if you know you can exit the situation, then that gives you more strength to exercise voice, but. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Th thank you for that. I appreciate that, Kiko. I'm going to turn it back over to Vivian. Vivian, if you got any other questions or comments. This was awesome. I'm so glad I brought it up and we talked about it. I was kind of nervous at first that people would, I don't know. I don't know why I thought that because you guys have been a very supportive and friendly and helpful group. So thank you so much. I feel like I need to comb this chat so many people were like dropping good resources and stuff so i want to thank you everybody yeah definitely i'll about that this one i will be sure to share the chat as well um well i'm glad we discussed that that was uh super important vivian thank you for always asking the amazing questions and bringing shit up i love it absolutely love it uh so we'll do the question that mark had um because you're in the queue from the beginning of the conversation so go for it man how, how do i follow this up <laughs> that was such a great conversation i really appreciate you you bring that up because um you know the the same conversations really impact me as well as identifying its personal color so i, I again I, I really felt uh this made me feel really special as well so i, I really appreciate that um for me <laughs> switching gears back to uh to uh analytics and um uh, I currently just got a huge dump of Salesforce data into our data warehouse, which is super exciting. Um, and essentially, I'm using that data to do a proof of 
concept as to why these tools I'm trying to bring in upgrade our warehouse are, are useful. And so I literally just got the dump of data uh, yesterday. I haven't had a chance to look at it, but I know there's a lot of other people who've used Salesforce data before, just done sales work. Um, and I'm just curious, like, what do you think will be some interesting questions or low hanging fruit that um, you think will be this interesting to, to, to a sales team? Um, I know you don't have access to my data and you don't know what's available. It's more so just high level, just some like, what are some key questions you think about when you're first about to explore some data? Because I haven't worked with sales data before. So I was thinking about this when I was, uh, I was just high level doing research into like Sabre metrics and the, the way that they're using anal baseball analytics to score teams, I found really interesting and I thought maybe you could draw some parallels to, to sales for that. So for example, um, one of the features they use in, in Sabre metrics, so this is talking about baseball, is they try to get the expected uh, win rate or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's some notion of this thing called Pythagorean expectation, right? And it's supposed to measure like um, how probable it is to to win a particular deal if that makes sense i'll find some resources for sure and I'll, I'll link it over um but that's just high level off the top of my head uh anybody have any tips here for sales data i mean apart oh yeah greg go for it hey mark uh it's definitely exciting man i used to support a, a team of sales folks and i can tell you the first thing you would need to do is interview them ask them what matters to them how do they spot you know you know great you know uh, prospects um, and, you know, kind of figure out what, what do they do to make quick decisions? Uh, you know, you would have to interview them first to see how you can um, tailor a, you know, a package for them so they can use that to take action. So that's going to get you there. Another thing I know they like, uh, something like uh, uh, price segmentations, right? So they want to see you know, who's bringing in the big bucks and they want to bucketize those, right? According to price and also what kind of profit these customers are bringing in. So most of the time you'll see that long tail, right? 20, you know, uh, first big companies, they generate 80% of the company's, um, you know, revenue or something like that. And then the tail, what can we do about the tail? Uh, where are we bleeding and all that stuff? So those are the low hanging fruits that you can get, but um, at the end of the day, you want to start with the with the team first to kind of understand their process. How do they leverage data to do their job and what makes them tick? And then you go from there and then you go after the data to go after the low hanging fruits. That's so good to hear because I talked to them last month, which is great. So I have those use cases, but like I really love the, the price segmentation, the bleeding and the tail. Super helpful. Mark, I dumped some resources here in the chat for you that uh, takes concepts from sabermetrics, applies it to sales. I think there's interesting parallels there for sure that are worth investigating. Joe, go for it. Yeah, actually my first job was a sales analyst. So, um, and, and it's interesting. So what I also learned, I think Greg had some, Greg had some great points uh, to follow onto that. Um, understand how the salesperson is compensated, right? Then you speak in their language, unless you know, Salespeople only care about one thing. Right? That's, their, that's their commission and their bonus. They do not care about anything else. They're pressed for time. And if you understand how they're compensated and what their incentives are, uh, you'll be able to produce great uh, reports and analytics for them. Um, that said, uh, you know, I, I also found that my relationship with uh, salespeople uh, was best when I could obviously get, a, get them the information they need. Right, so the twenty percent that will yield eighty percent of results, but also come to them with some some interesting um, tidbits, which could move the needle in a direction that that helps them with their compensation. So maybe, uh, you know, one company, um, you know, we're selling consumer electronics, and so it's, th did you know that at these stores, you know, maybe your Costco's, you know, uh, you know, by channel, maybe show like, okay, so these different colorways are selling really well, right? maybe show that these are, they're selling online versus offline. And so then you can start drawing some comparisons. I think giving salespeople a leading edge, they can go to their customers. Um, that also helps. They like to, uh, every salesperson wants an edge that they can use to, um, you know, win over, 
uh, you know, uh, the customer, because it's, it's highly competitive, right? In almost every industry right now. And we deal with a lot of technology companies. I deal with salespeople every day. And if they're always looking for even the slightest, you know, 0.5% edge that'll give them the sale, they'll take it. But the baseline always starts with a comp plan and every, every company is different. So you have to understand how that salesperson is compensated. Cause literally it's the only thing they care about. If you don't, if you give them information that applies to their comp plan, they'll love you. If you uh, come to them with a bunch of random numbers and stuff, uh, you're, you're dead. <laughs> so, so good luck. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much don't take my egghead statistical approach for it. Uh, first find out how the hell it is that they get paid and then try to help them optimize that. I like that approach. Well, uh, I, I actually took your egghead approach when I first started, yeah. right? Because I wanted to show off how smart I was. Very stupid idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very dumb. Um, so, Mark, was that helpful? Got any good Super helpful. I, I took notes. I'll paste them into the chat. All right. Uh, any other questions from anyone? I don't have anything else in the queue. So if anybody has a question, you can just go ahead. Feel free to unmute. You don't even have to have a question. If you have any comments, based on the previous discussion we're having, please, by all means, uh, now's the time for you guys to uh, to go for it. The floor is wide open for you guys. I'm just going to keep on talking until I see somebody unmute their microphone. And that is Makiko. Go for it. Yeah. So sales metrics. Yeah. That was like three years of my life. Um, yeah. I would check out, uh, if you want some ideas. So I, I put some book recommendations in there. Um, the one I would definitely recommend is like, um, is cracking the sales management code. Uh, Cause what it does is it actually talks about like essentially the different sort of concerns that typically uh, are in sales um, and like the different metrics that people use to measure it. That one is super nice. Um, as Joe said, compensation comp, comp, comp is like amazing. And I feel like whenever I've talked to like a sales, whenever I've talked to like a, like a VP of like revenue or whatever um, the thing that like the dream they always want to get to is be is to be able to go from like the marketing funnel to the sales funnel to like the like the close revenue and then to get that to like the comp right if you and if you can tie that with like headcount and like hiring and like ramping then they're like oh my god that's the dream so that's like quick can you repeat uh, they said marketing funnel to sales funnel to the close yeah yeah so uh, so one thing that's like super helpful, and this goes back to like talking to sales, um, as like Greg and Joe both man, uh, um, mentioned, is like understanding just uh, the operational processes of how they do business. Like how are they making money and like what are the levers that they can sort of manipulate in order to do so? Um, yeah, because like if you don't have that mental model, then it's kind of like with the, with marketing and sales slash growth, like you can kind of just rabbit hole on a bunch of different things without like sort of driving any value. So starting with that like mental model of how the business actually works and it depends for every type of business, right? For example, if they are like subscription, if they're uh, for example, B2B versus like B2C versus like B2B, B2C, like there are different things or for example, if they're domestic versus international, all those things impact the like frame, like the framework of what's going on with the business and how they make money. Um, so that, that's like the first thing It's like making sure you understand like the business level of it. Um, because once you understand the business level, once you understand like the core sort of problems and stages, then a lot of times the actual, the data science and machine learning parts are not that hard. Um, you know, because a lot of times it's just like, can you like forecast or can you like, you know, classify or can you, um, uh, do sorts of things like low hanging fruit projects. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, and it's a combination of talking to people and also doing some sort of like literature and also looking at companies that are sort of, um, you know, in that space. So for example, uh, Clary, that's an app, uh, Clary is a, uh, is a, is a product where they specifically focus on like sales dashboarding and metrics and analytics. And so their blog is a really good resource uh, for different things. Um, I listed a bunch of the books. Um, the top ones I'd say are Lean Analytics, uh, Compensating the Sales Force, uh, Cracking the Sales Management Code, and then also um, something about, I have to find the book. It's like something like coming up with the comp plan that your CFO loves, but your salespeople hate, or vice versa, something like that. Um, 
So I would check those out. Um, once you understand the business model, um, understand the different stages, you know, so, uh, and the terminology. Um, and that's to be honest, how I got a lot of my jobs in, in analytics. It wasn't because I was a good analyst. I was probably terrible, but it was because I understood like how I could like talk to people for whatever reason. Um, you know, so once you have that, then um, understanding sort of what are the different stages they care about and then where are the metrics there? Because everything ultimately just comes down to like conversion rates. Um, and then also understanding like, mm, like average value and things like that. But that's my, yeah, that's my two cents. Thank you very much. And shameless self-promotion. The author of Lean Analytics was a guest on the Arts of Data Science podcast, Alistair Kroll. Go and listen to that if you have not yet already. Thank you so much for everyone dropping gems for me and like set me up well for my career. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's uh let's go, Greg, then Joe, and then last call for questions. You can put it into the chat. First. Yeah, I just want to say, like the other thing I would I would say, Mark, um, anyone else doing sales analytics? Salespeople are always asking me, um, who should I talk like who who is the uh the, the linchpin in a company? right? Who's the influencer that's going to help get the sale? Who should I talk to? I think if you can get really good, this is like an under underappreciated part of a sales analytics. I think it's like figuring out the graph of a company and an org chart and then figuring out who to talk to and who you can suggest a salesperson talk to. I know that's part of their job. A lot of things are part of their job. I know salespeople are really lazy um, in a good way. Uh, they're lazy like me. They <laughs> So, but uh you know, if you, if you can make suggestions in terms of, uh, yeah, I think these are like the top five people you should be focusing on at this company uh, for sales, you will be, um, you're going to go places for sure. You may even be able to start a company around that. So just saying that, that tends to be like, I would say the biggest request is just how to navigate a, a company hands down. Cause like knowing your historical sales and like knowing, you know, what products are selling well, that's one thing who to, who to talk to, to get the sale sales is almost hundred percent of the time. It's a, it's a communication game, right? It, there's no data science to it. It's, it's, it's just talking. So keep that in mind. Yeah, absolutely. So I, advice, Greg, go for it. Yeah. I really like what, what you, what you said earlier about the edge, right? So sales folks, they really love having that edge. So one thing I know for sure for me that I saw is they liked to uh, have the in and outs of what the competitors is doing. Like for example, price wise or uh, marketing wise, you know, you know, portfolio offering type, you know, value uh, package uh, that competitors were offering. So if you can get those faster than they can for them and kind of, you know, help them, you know, with that inside info uh, or any info out on the outside market, uh, they can use that because uh, to me, uh, somebody in sales, they they use tricks, mind tricks, man. They, they, they're kind of like mini psychologists that, you know, puts you in a, a inside of a funnel that helps you, you know, that forces you to make a quick decision. And uh, they, they get trained for that. So um, if you give them the edge that uh, Joe was talking about, I think uh, it's going to make their lives, uh, they're going to become more effective. The other thing that I see as a downside, though, um, for B2B, and I don't know how about B2C, what I've seen in B2B is that sales folks will uh, develop some sort of relationship with, with, um, with customers to, to some, some point their own detriment. Um, so you will be close to the numbers. You will see that some prices aren't optimized and that you will kind of experience some sort of bleeding where uh, you feel like this, this customer isn't purchasing enough or shouldn't be priced like this, should, the price should go up. And when you're going to push back to the sales folks, um, even though they know the profit will come through to the company because that's the easiest thing you could do. Uh, increasing prices has a bigger impact on the company than saving cost at the back end. Um, but increasing a price can rupture the relationship between your company and the customer, especially if it's a B2B. So sales will fight you for that because they have they feel like it's a it's a sensitive relationship that you're asking them to potentially break so you're going to have to kind of navigate this uh 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 area for them to to help them understand where to make a, a price impact and other, other things like that 
Mark, hopefully that was helpful for you and you can start making Hulu trillions of dollars with all this advice because it is a the goal. Like that. that is the goal. Yeah. Uh, any last minute questions here? I didn't see any in the chat, so I um, assume there are no more questions. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for hanging out and sticking with us today, guys. Uh, check out the interview I released with John K. Thompson, the uh, the legend himself, talking about how to build analytics teams. Um, and keep tuning into the podcast. We've got a bunch of awesome stuff happening. Guys, remember, you've got one life on this planet, and so do you and you and that person does too over there and that person in the corner. Yep. One life on this planet down there in the bottom. Yes, you also got one life on this planet. We all got one life on this planet. So while we are here, why don't we just treat each other with some respect, some love, some kindness, treat us all as equals uh, because realistically, like the universe has been around for what, 14 billion something years. I'm 38. Like what's 38 over 14 billion? Um, very fucking infinitesimally small, right? Um, so might as well make those whatever 80 to 120 years we got on this planet, um, lifting each other up, not making it shitty for other people. All right. So take care, everybody. Have a good rest of the weekend and I will see you next week. Cheers.